be seated. Thank you. Lesson 23 on Lordship. And uh, probably another two, maybe three lessons, and I'll be done as we begin to move towards the end of this study. Not sure what the next study will be. I'm still praying about that. Usually I do topical studies on Wednesdays, so. But uh, since we're closing up this study on Lordship, it's only appropriate to examine just who is this Lord Jesus Christ, what are his attributes, and we began to look at that last week when we saw uh, that he's, he is Lord, okay? We're going to talk about that more tonight. But we examined him as God. We examined him, examined him as being sovereign. And we examined him as being our Savior. So tonight, as we have discussed in the past 22 lessons, we will focus in on his lordship. Jesus is Lord. And consistently in Scripture, there is an affirmation of the lordship of Christ in every way. Jesus is the Lord of judgment. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is Lord over all. Acts 10.36 says, The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. He is called Lord in the Greek, the word kurios, 400 or 747 times in the New Testament. You know how many times he's referred to as Savior? 92. 747 times as Lord, 92 as Savior. Okay? Uh, when you read the teachings, the early teachings of Christ, you, you, about Christ, in the early church, there was a heavy, heavy, heavy dosage on the Lordship of Christ, which has deteriorated over the centuries. When I talk the early church, I'm talking the first, second, third, fourth, fifth centuries. Now, the centrality of Jesus' Lordship, in your outline the word is central. The centrality of Jesus' Lordship to the gospel message is clear from the way Scripture presents the, term, uh, the terms of salvation. Can I see your outline? I want to make sure I get that first part right. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, let me say that again. The centrality of Jesus' lordship to the gospel message is clear from the way Scripture presents the terms of salvation. Now, are, there are those who dichotomize, do you understand the word dichotomize? When you dichotomize something, you take something that is presented in a whole and you split it, dichotomize, okay? There are those now in the church who want to teach and want people to believe that Jesus is Christ, Jesus is Savior, and Jesus is Lord, and not all of those things necessarily are wrapped into one ball, especially, especially the teaching on Jesus as Savior, and then subsequently yielding to Jesus as your Lord. Okay? Are you with me? All right, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present you some of what is taught in that regards tonight so that you can see what other people teach in regards to that, okay? But there's those that now teach. This was never taught in the early church that you can accept Christ as your Savior and subsequent to that acceptance, then later on, accept him as your Lord, all right? 
Acts 2.21. Now, this is, this, is, this is a basic biblical invitation to faith. All right? And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? Very basic. Acts 2.36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 16.31. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Let me say this here. You know, God's word, one of the, the things I most enjoy about God's word is it's very, very detail-oriented. In fact, I believe there are no documents of any type anywhere that are more detail-oriented. Even military manuals pale in comparison when compared to the detail of God's holy word. One of my early jobs in the military was writing operating instructions for security police for the conveyance of nuclear warheads from davis Monthan Air Force Base to the 18 missile silos around the city of Tucson at that time. Those operating instructions to move a nuclear warhead were very, very detailed. And I loved writing those things because I'm a detailed type of person. But when I remember back that, those writings then compared to what I study now, there's no comparison. See, when the writers of the Bible who were driven by the Holy Spirit, use the word Lord in a verse, there's a reason. When the writers of the Bible, driven by the Holy Spirit, use the word Christ in a verse, there's a reason. And when the writers of the Bible, driven by the Holy Spirit, use the word Savior in a verse, there's a reason. Each one of those words are distinctive and specific, all explaining the same part of the Godhead. And I think sometimes what happens is we're reading the Bible and we just run over those words and we don't consider what those words have to say to us, okay? So it's important for us to understand just exactly what these words are talking about because there's people out there that will take those different words and twist them and change them and try to develop theologies around them and doctrine, okay? Romans 10, 9 and 10. I'll be here back and forth probably the most of the night. But it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, again, Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confess confession is made unto salvation. So all of these first four or five verses that I've talked to, to this evening, I would say include indisputable evidence that the lordship of Christ is part of the gospel that we need to believe. Okay? That's my premise. We have seen in this, in this study over the past 22 lessons that Jesus' lordship includes the idea of dominion, of authority, of sovereignty, and of the right to govern. And I think all of those things are implicit in the phrase, confess Jesus as your Lord. When you confess him as your Lord, those are all the areas that, in other areas, that he is Lord over. So it is then not true that when people who come to Christ for salvation must do so. so. So is it not true then that people who come to Christ for salvation must do so with a willingness to surrender to him as Lord? That's a question. Is that right? Is? Okay. Now, when I, when I taught this 
eight years, seven or eight years ago, I get attacked for being a uh, Salvation Plus guy, and I've, I've, I've got more e emails on it this time than I did last time, uh, mainly from people that see uh, some of our lessons online. But many people attack Lordship Theology, and they use that same verse that I just quoted from in Romans 10 as the primary place where they want to set up their battleground. And much has been written attempting to explain how one can confess Jesus as Lord, yet continue to rebel, in your outline, the word is rebel against his authority. Let me say that again. Much has been written attempting to explain how one can confess Jesus as Lord, yet continue to rebel against his authority. You know why? Because then you make rebellious people that sit in churches feel okay. It's okay that you don't confess Jesus as Lord, or it's okay you'll get to the point where you will, he will be your Lord. It's okay. You're okay. All we really want to do is make sure you're in that chair. And if we, it doesn't matter if we have to tell you the truth. But some take the, the position that the term Lord, when it's used in Scripture, in connection with the gospel, does not mean sovereign master, as it does everywhere else, but rather it means deity. Now this is going to get thick and deep, okay? So if there's something you need to me to explain, just stop me. All right? Because... There's a big difference of thinking as Jesus as Lord and thinking as Jesus as only deity. Okay? Because that, because that word Lord is not a popular word in American society today. Nobody can be your Lord. Do you know that they changed the names of the team owners in the NBA? They used to be owners. What are they now? They call them governors because they cannot own a team made up of men, even though it's their team. So this is the, this is the philosophy that permeates through our society. Dr. Charles Ryrie. I've talked about Dr. Ryrie before, okay? How many of you know or have heard of Dr. Charles Ryrie? Dr. Ryrie is a very articulate arguer for the philosophy that I've just expounded upon. Dr. Ryrie served as professor of systematic theology and the dean of doctoral studies at Dallas, Dallas Theological Seminary for many years. He served as president of Philadelphia Baptist University he was awarded a doctorate of letters uh, from the Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary by Jerry Falwell, and he is the author of the Ryrie Study Bible, which has sold well over two and a half million copies. Okay? Very influ influential. And on most things, very, very accurate. But since I have been presenting all this material in favor of lordship theology, let me present material against lordship theology because when you leave here tonight, it's up to you what kind of relationship you have with the Lord. Is he the Lord of your life or is he merely the author of a suggestion manual? All right? So Ryrie writes this. Come along. Stay with me now. To be sure, Ryrie says, Lord does often mean master. But in the New Testament, it also means God. And then he quotes Acts 3.22. For Moses said truly to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise, for you, will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. 
So Ryrie says there that Lord means God. Luke 19.32, he says, refers to Lord as an owner. See, what Ryrie's, Ryrie's premise is, is he's going to take that word Lord and he's going to lower it. Now, in his first instance, he elevated it in his mind. In my mind, there's Lord and God are the same. But now he's going to lower it. Listen, Luke 19.32. So those who were sent away went their way and found it just as he has said to them. But as they were loosing the coat, the order, owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the coat? And they said, The Lord has need of him. In that instance, Ryrie is saying, Lord mean, means master. John 4.11, he says, Lord means sir. The woman by the well. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? 1 Corinthians 8, 5. The only intent here is to lessen the word Lord. 1 Corinthians 8, 5. The word Lord means man-made idols, and he's right. For even if there are so-called gods, little g, whether in heaven or earth, as there are many gods and many Lords, little well. And he adds then in his footnotes, it can even mean somebody's husband, the word Lord. 1 Peter 3, 6, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Okay? So his premise is, just because the word says Lord, doesn't mean it's talking about Lord. Now, I'm not sure what he's trying to assert here other than that point, that the word Lord can have other meanings than just being Jesus, because he showed that, okay? He showed that, all right? And I would agree with that. He continues, though, in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, he says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And then he says, Lord in this sense must mean, now he says it means Jehovah God, for the simple reason that unsaved people can and do say Lord, meaning Sir, in reference to Christ. Before they have even before they even have the spirit of God. Now that's to me. That is someone who is lost in their theology. I don't even know for sure what he's talking about. Do you know what he's talking about, Michael? He's trying to make the shoe fit. He's trying to what? Trying to make the shoe fit. Okay. The All right. Okay. To ask you a question about Lord when you talk about the Lord, because I, I get caught up in the, in the days of the knights and the kings. Uh -huh. And back in that archaic time, a Lord was an owner, a master, a supplier, a dictator, everything. Everything. To him, and nothing was ever in question. Right. That was where the old meaning of, of Lord came from. When did that decline? When you, at what point in time did that start to go downhill? Uh, probably about the last 120 years. It's like, well, you know, when you read the word Christ, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Mes well, Messiah. Yeah. So. Well. But see, and the thing is, is that a lot of this, Dr. Ryrie, as far as I know, I think he passed away a couple years ago. But he was a he was a he was a honcho at some of these uh, seminaries for a long time, and taught this to people for a long time. And if you're a young college student, are you going to believe him? Probably, you're going to be influenced by him. 
He also says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess your mouth with your mouth of Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. This is what he says about it, that. It is the confession of Jesus as God and thus faith in the God-man that saves from sin. It is the confession of Jesus as God and thus faith in the God-man that saves from sin. So if this is, you know, I like to, I like to, I like to try to figure out how people think. I, I like to figure out how you guys think. Did you know that? I do. So if I could say this, I think his assertion is built on two foundational pillars. First, Lord can mean more than Lord, okay? Like the guy that runs the house, okay? Uh, as in Jesus is Lord. And then secondly, his second pillar would be that we are saved by Jesus who is God but not Lord. Because that's what he just said. Okay? It is a confess of, confession of Jesus as God and thus faith in the God man that saves us. And I just don't... Maybe I'm simple-minded, but I just don't understand... First of all, I don't even understand why you need to make all this, uh, why you have to uh, make all this, why you have to argue this point, because it's po pointless to me. You know, there's a trinity. Uh, Jesus is a trinity. Yes, he is a trinitarian. Well, why, why do you want the less than the two? Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand that. Go ahead, Will. Well, that's the whole idea. That's how, you get, that's how you can have churches full of disobedient people, and they feel good about themselves. But you can't be saved if you're disobedient. Well, you can under his premise, because you can have Jesus as Savior, and you don't necessarily have to have him as Lord yet. That's part of the process of salvation for, for this type of belief. He claims that those who argue that Lord means sovereign master. What does, what does the word kurios actually mean in the Greek? It means someone who has the power to, to so, decide life or death. Kind of like what Michael said. Somebody that holds sway over every part of your life, no matter what, how big it is or how small it is. If you want to read uh, what Dr. Ryrie says, if, you're, if you want to punish yourself, you can read his book called Balance, Balancing, this, I, love, I love the name, Balancing the Christian Life. No. So, I think... I understand him. I think I do. But I wish Dr. Ryrie would have just relaxed. Maybe he had too much cough, caffeine or something when he was writing this part of the book. Because I would think that in no way would we want to do anything to, I don't, want, I don't even want to, to manipulate the concept of the deity of Jesus Christ. The word in your outline is deity. And what he seems to want to do is manipulate the deity of Christ so it's easier for us to understand. And really what I, he does, I think, is muddies the water. I think, I would say this, I think Ryrie's correct when he says that when Scripture refers to Jesus as Lord, it means he is God. I agree with that entirely. But his, his idea that we, that, we, that we can only be saved by the Lord God, the man God, is, is a concept that I find hard to swallow. And I would, I, would, I would thank him for the interpretation where he says that Jesus is Lord means he's also God. I would thank him for that interpretation because that strengthens my point of view that absolute rulership over us is inherent in the word of God, in the idea 
of him, him being our Lord. How can God, how can Lord not mean sovereign master? What kind of Lord would our Lord be if he weren't sovereign? And I don't know, maybe I'm too picky, but, so, you know, so he's going to use this, these, he's going to pick apart these words, so I'm going to start picking them apart too. In John 20, Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Okay? I don't think he was saying, my God, my God, was he? He was saying, my Lord and my God. That's exactly what he meant. No matter what, uh, Thomas was affirming Jesus as his Lord. Let's use the word master, okay? And as his God, recognizing his deity. See, I'm afraid... afraid uh, that that whole thought process, as I said earlier, that Jesus is our master, it makes us uncomfortable today, especially our younger people. Because they've been indoctrinated with a theology that is absent, that is absent on the idea of lordship. Unless they've been brought up in a home where it's been taught, because it's not taught at very many churches. If you go back again to that Romans 10 verse and look at the context, in verse 12, the phrase is used, Lord of all. That's used to describe the Savior. It means that Jesus is Lord over all, Jews, Gentiles, believers, unbelievers alike. And whenever you attempt to uh, interpret things to rid the meaning of sovereign dominion in regards to Lord, it makes no sense to me. So when I read Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and I could put in parentheses, of all, of everybody, of everything, he's even creator, you shall be saved, okay? That, that makes perfect sense to me. And I think I can support that scripturally from, the, from Genesis through the book of Revelation. Certainly the word Lord means deity. Wherever it calls Jesus Lord in connection with the gospel message. That Christ is God is a fundamental component of the gospel. One, how can one... One cannot be saved and deny, the word in your outline is deny the deity of Christ, right? Okay? 1 John 4, 2, 3 speaks to that idea. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. See? See? And anti-lordship theologians want to remove the idea of authority, dominion, and the right to command from, uh, from the picture of the gospel. Then what's left? Savior. That's all they want is Savior. That's enough for them. That's, why, that's how you can teach, the, uh, teach a watered-down gospel. You only teach part of it. Yeah, Mike. You can't, in my understanding, you can't have a healthy, respectful fear of God because fear of wisdom is the fear of wisdom is the beginning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. You cannot have a respectful fear of God in the right way without understanding that He is without question. We're trying to lessen. We're trying to. We're trying to take that because we have this tolerance thing going on in the world today. That's right. God won't kidnap you. You know, I, I understand. It's a, there's a fear. You've got a dog with a broken spirit in hell, and you want to respect the reverence for that. Mm -hmm. We're trying to take that away and we're trying to explain all these things. We've we, we lost that. Huh? I believe we've lost that in our modern day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
You know, a person living in rebellion against Christ's authority doesn't recognize them, Christ as Lord in any way, sense, any way, shape, or form. You know, I was counseling with a young man this afternoon. And uh, I, was I was trying to talk to him about his obligation in regards to obedience. And I was, I was, I was asking him questions about his lifestyle which were all indicators of disobedience to the Lord. But when we get all done discussing, it's as if he still wants to be treated as a child of God. But I don't want to treat him as a child of God. I told him I wanted to treat him as a selfish person because he's selfish. He doesn't think of his family first. He thinks of only what he wants. I don't know if he'll come back, but we'll see. But yes, Patty. I'm reminded of trust and obey. Ah. Without trust, it's very difficult to obey. Without trust, it's difficult to obey. Yeah, yeah. I would say that's correct. It's. Yeah, amen. Titus 1, 16. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Okay? And you could put, you could actually, I think you could almost sub substitute, but in obedience they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So if I understand what that says, it says the signature, if you will, of saving faith is surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus. A definitive test, and, you know, 1 John is just full of this, this, this wording of how you compare this person who's saved and this person who's not saved, and it's all, a lot of it is based upon obedience. But a definitive test of whether a person belongs to Christ is a willingness to bow down to Christ's authority. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Paul writes, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that unsaved people can't say the words, Jesus is Lord, because they can, and they do. Sometimes they even profess those words. But Jesus himself, in the Gospel of John that we've previously studied, pointed out the paradox of those who called him Lord, <clears throat> those that were, no, that were called believers and disciples, but did not really believe him. Remember that? We've studied many scriptures in that regards in, uh, well, it begins in John 2. And again, who else knows Jesus is Lord? The demons know Jesus is Lord. Mark 21, 24, Jesus is teaching in a synagogue. A de demon-possessed man stands up and he cries out, leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Demons know who he is. Mark 3.11, And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. And the demon possessed in Mark 5.7 cries out with a loud voice, and he says, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Don't torment me. 1 Corinthians again, again, 12.3, refers to this idea, Jesus is Lord. It has to mean, you know, to say the words is very simple, but it has to mean more than just saying the words. It has to do with acknowledging him as Lord by obeying him. You know, in the military, uh, Everything was based on what? 
obedience. You might, you might be a, you might be a sergeant who served t 15 years in the military, and here comes this lieutenant, and he's about seven or eight years younger than you. And hopefully he's a good learner, because we used to say it. What was that old saying? It takes uh, two takes two lieutenants to make one good staff sergeant. But but everything in the military is built upon obedience. You can't you you if you if you're going to get if you're going to do anything with a lieutenant, you're going to teach him a young lieutenant, so that by the time he becomes a captain, he might be a good captain. But ultimately, everything has to devolve to obedience. When, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the colonel yells, you need to take that hill, and you need to take that hill in 30 minutes, is there going to be a debate? There can be no debate. Men just, have to, men just have to do what they're told. I think that's one reason why our military has so much trouble uh, getting enough people to join the military today. They're struggling to meet their quotas, okay? But we have read that the Holy Spirit, we have read that that is by the Holy Spirit that, that people are able to confess Jesus as Lord. So surrendering to him as Lord is not a, a meritorious human work on our part. It's just believing him as, just like as believing him as Lord. When you believe, when you truly believe, I believe you surrender. I believe those things are, are two sides of the same coin. I don't believe, see, what really what they, what they, part of what they're trying to teach is, is that obedience is, is a good work. And I just don't think that's, I just don't think. And it's almost a good work that's done to earn favor with God. But I believe believing and obedience are the sovereign works of God on the heart of man. And I'm going to maintain that belief as it was once taught in our churches. Jesus could not be Savior if he were not our Lord. Furthermore, if he were not our Lord, he could not be king or Messiah or our great high priest. Apart from his lordship, every aspect of his saving work is impossible. When we come to Jesus for salva salvation, we come to the one who is Lord over all. Any message that omits that truth, I don't think can qualify as being called the gospel. Without the lordship, without lordship, the gospel is a crippled message. And I think we can see the results of that crippled message by the condition of our crippled churches. The gospel message represents Jesus as Lord and Savior and demands that those who would receive him take him for who he is. John Flavel, F-L-A-V-E-L, is a 17th century English Puritan. He said this, the gospel offer of Christ includes all of his offices and gospel faith. Just so to receive him, to submit to him, as well as to be redeemed by him, to imitate him in the holiest of his, holiness of his life, as well as to reap the purchases, purchases and fruits of his death, it must be an entire receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tozer wrote this, to urge men and women to believe in a divided Christ is bad teaching, for no one can receive half of Christ or a third of Christ or a quarter of the person of Christ. We are not b saved by believing in an office nor in a work. You get the idea? The message that presents a Savior 
who is less than Lord cannot claim to be the gospel according to Jesus. It, you've got to take, it's either the whole package or it's no package. If he's not Savior, then he can't be Lord. If he's not Lord, he can't be Savior. He is Lord, and I can't see, a, see how those that refuse him, the word in your outline is Lord, can use them as their Savior. Everyone that receives him must surrender to his authority. For us to say we receive Christ, when in fact we reject his right to reign over us, is utterly absurd. When we accept anti-lordship anti theology in our churches, we are accepting the holding on to of sin with one hand and taking Jesus Christ in the other hand. What kind of picture is that? What kind of salvation is that? What kind of salvation is it that leaves people in bondage to sin? So it is my prayer that this would be the gospel, the only gospel that will ever be declared at New Life Family Worship Center. That Jesus Christ, who is Lord incarnate, humbled himself to die on our behalf. Thus he became the sinless sacrifice to pay the penalty of our guilt. He rose again from the dead to declare with power that he is Lord over all. And he offers eternal life freely to sinners who will surrender to him in humble and repentant faith. The gospel promises nothing to haughty rebels but for broken, penitent sinners, it graciously offers everything that pertains to life and godliness. And that, beloved, is a gospel that will preach. And that, beloved, is a gospel that will transform lives. The last word in your outline is the word change. Okay, I can get off my soapbox now. Questions or comments? Well... <clears throat>